It's like, uh, it's like the chalkboard has been erased. But some of you maybe remember this, that there's one thing about erasing chalkboards, and then it's another when they come in and actually clean them. And they look brand new. Uh, to me, this is like not only being erased, but being cleaned. It's, it's fresh. It's like... Uh, Fresh sheets. Y'all know what I mean? Just, you sleep better. Um, change. You know, over the years, uh, elections and on and on, we hear the word change a good bit. Um, this is a good time for change. I want you to turn with me to Psalms, the 40th chapter. And uh, we're going to be going back and forth these 10 verses a, a good bit. Uh, today. So uh, I, I don't think I'm going to actually just read them to you because for time, I'm going to go back and forth. But, uh, uh, but change is something that we fear sometimes because we just don't understand it. There's some things that we don't understand. Does that, uh, can we all agree with that? It was, like the, it was like the man that come from the deep mountains of Tennessee and he went to the city for the first time. <laughs> he saw these doors that they just magically opened up. And he saw this older, sort of decrepit lady walk and get on the elevator and the door's closed. A few seconds later, the door opened up. And this beautiful woman walked out. <laughs> Son, go get your mama. <laughs> Just didn't understand what it was. And when you, when you don't understand something, you, you, you sometimes are afraid of it. You, you are you're, you're standoffish. Um, I want to I talk to you this morning from, from this subject about, uh, about change and, and what that means. I, I want to share with you a, a biblical concept of change. Not necessarily a change in your actions as much as a change in your perception of God. Who is God? Uh, who are you? What, what does God want for you? What, what does God desire to do in your life? Where... Where should I be? My actions, my, 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 the way I live my life, how, how does God want me to do that? And, and how do I do that? We talked about this a number of times where even Paul said, you know, I, I want to do these things, but I don't do these things. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. What's going on there? Well, a lot of it is a perception of God and a misunderstanding of who God is, and, and a misunderstanding of what God is trying to do in my life. How many of you are, look around, even perhaps at the end of this year, or the beginning, or, or last year, or the end, or the beginning of this year, and you're, you're thinking, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? I, I want this year. Anybody here starting today all thinking, I want this year to be better than last year? Anybody dreading this year? Oh, this year's going to be so bad. No, I mean, you're, you're looking, oh, this is going to be, I, this is, it, it can't get worse. It's got to get better. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to make this change. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to join the gym. Man, I know, that, I know that every gym in town couldn't wait until today. I mean, can you imagine the influx of income at the local gym in the next week? Also realizing that you're going to sign up and they're going to be busy for about two weeks. And then they're going to get your money the rest of the year and never have to see you. It's a, you know, I, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, but yet we don't follow through so many things. 
Let's begin. I want you to, in, in Psalm the 40th chapter, I want you to listen to what David is saying here. And we're going to break this down as we, as we go through the, these, these scriptures this morning. Go ahead, Connor, if you will. The first, uh, first verse. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Some would say 2016. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. A new song in my mouth. Anybody want a new song? Amen. Something new, something, something refreshing, something refreshing. Look, let's, let's back up just for, just for a moment. The first thing that David tells us in this psalm is what his attitude was toward hearing God. From God. I'm waiting patiently for the Lord. I, 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 I need to hear from the Lord. And then he tells us what God's attitude is towards you when you seek Him. He said, And He turned to me and He heard my cry. Which signifies, He turned to me and He heard my cry, which signifies, David is crying out to God. Why? Why is David crying out to God? What in the world is going on in his life that caused him to seek God? What's going on? He found himself in what he considered to be a, as the scripture tells us, a horrible pit, a slimy pit. Pit. I love the way that the King James Version describes that. It uses that word horrible, which I think is a very important word. Horrible literally means destructive. It is a terrible place to be. A pit refers to a cistern. In other words, he said, I have found myself in a horrible place of destruction with no way out. What it means to be in that system. There's no way out of this thing. I don't care, Pastor, that it's a new year. I'm still in this hole. It, just because the clock went from 11.59 to 12 a.m. last night. I, I, I'm sorry, I heard the fireworks and I heard everybody keeping me awake, but it didn't change the fact that I'm still in my horrible pit. It didn't change the fact that I'm, I'm still in this hole and I don't see any way out. There's only one thing to do when you're in a place and the only thing that you can do is look up. That's what you do. You look up. You, you, you simply look up. The, the, and God's response to David was this in that second verse. He lifted me up out of the horrible pit. Isn't that, I don't know about you, but that may not do a thing in the world for you, but man, it does some wonderful things for me right now. Amen. The only way out, look up. And God lifted him up out of that slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. And it said, he set his feet on a rock and gave him a firm place to stand. Here I am in a pit, in mire. I'm sinking. I don't see any way out. I look up. I called unto God. I cried out to Him. He lifted me up out of my pit and out of my mud, and He set me on a solid rock. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been sinking before, but there's nothing like... I'll never forget one day I was playing golf. That was your first problem. 
Because when I play golf, it takes me off the beaten path. It takes me to the extreme. And one day, I hit a ball. I can't believe it. I'm standing there. I'm lined up. I swing just like that. And the ball goes like that. I said, you crazy ball. I didn't, I didn't hit you over there. And the ball said, yes, you did. Well, I go over there and I, I, I see my ball is laying right beside the water. So I'm happy. I'm not in the water. <laughs> it was a good shot. And I get over there and it's, it's, it, where we were playing, you, you went down. The, the green was up here and it, it just went down in the water. It was a pretty steep hill. We were actually at Echo Farms, guys. And uh, it went down. No, I wasn't. I wasn't at Echo Farms. I was down. Uh, who cares where I was? Hampstead. <laughs> Hampstead, somewhere down there. And, and it went down. And so I was walking over there, but the guys were, had their carts. And, and, and I'm, so I'm walking down the hill. And I look, I can't even see the carts over there. And I'm walking and I see the ball. And I start to step and get my ball. And my shoe just begins to sink. <laughs> and as my foot began to sink further, and further and further. I'm trying to pull it up, and the mud is a suction cup. Sucking me down. And I'm thinking, I'm going to die right here on a golf course. And I'm yelling out. Nobody's paying attention to me. Nobody whatsoever. And I'm yelling. finally somebody hears me, and I see the cart coming across the path. And I'm thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live. I'm going to live. And they come over there, and they don't even go down there to where I am. This is the kind of buddies that I play golf with. They take a golf club and extend it to me. <laughs> grab hold of that. So I grab hold of the golf club and, and I'm pulling. And as I'm pulling, nothing is letting go of my foot. Nothing. And finally, my foot <laughs> pops up out. No shoe. <laughs> and one of the guys says, Oh, I think we can get that shoe. And I know I, I was down to my knee. You're not going to get the shoe. Oh, yeah, I think we can get the shoe. I pulled my other shoe off and I threw it in the middle of the water. I said, come on, let's go. Let's go. But I'm going to tell you something. When I came up out of there, when my foot was on something solid, I'm thinking, hallelujah. That feels good. I don't care about playing golf anymore. I might have to be barefooted anyway if I play. I don't have any shoes. Not to mention the odor from that mud and that stench. That's what the mire does. It, it's, it's, can you imagine what he felt when he said, He lifted me up out of that mire and he set my feet on a solid surface. Man, what a wonderful feeling. I want you to know something this morning that this new year, this day, God wants to put a new song inside of you. He wants to lift you up out of your mess and put you on something very solid in your life. Solid. Not something that's sinking. But maybe we need to understand that, that solid that he's talking about. What is he really referring to? When he says, he set my feet on a solid rock, what is he referring to? Well, Jesus, of course, he's the rock. I realize that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. I realize that. I understand that. But I, I somehow think that he's talking about just something just a little bit more. In fact, in the, in the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter, Connor will go to it. I'm not going to read it, but I, he, you can reference it as, he, as it's up there. Jesus looked at his, his disciples and he said, Who do men say that I am? Well, some say you this, some say you Guys, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. But my Father in heaven, you're going to be called Peter, a rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church, 
and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Isn't that awesome? But listen to this. Go on down to that last verse. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It had nothing to do with Peter. He's not saying, Peter, I'm going to build my church on you. What he was saying is, I'm going to build my church on the revelation that you have just received. And that is that I am the Christ the son of the living God. I'm going to build my church on individuals who are willing to listen to the Spirit of God. That's what he's saying. See, my father reveals something to you. And that knowledge, an individual that is willing to listen to the Spirit of God, that is the type of individual, that is the way that I can build my church. Go back to what he just said in Psalms, the 40th chapter. Then what is he meaning by this? He's meaning, listen, I lifted you up out of the miry clay. I lifted lifted you up out of that horrible pit, out of that life that you've been living, out of that hurt, out of that pain, out of that anguish, out of everything that you've been going through. I have lifted you up and I have set you on a solid rock, which is an understanding that now you listen to the Spirit of God. And while listening to the Spirit of God, that's where your joy comes from. That's where your peace comes from from. That's where your victory comes from. That's where your new song comes from that I'm going to put in your mouth and I'm going to put it in your mouth because I want you to sing it. I'm not putting it in your heart that you may hide it. I'm putting a new song in your mouth so that you sing it. And it comes out of what I have done for you. Of what I am doing for you. Not what you're doing not what you have accomplished. And out of that knowledge of who I am and what I can do in your life, that is the keys. That is the key. That is the key to victory. That is the key to binding things on this earth that are bound in heaven and loosing things on earth that are loosened. That's the key. It's by the Spirit of God, not by your might, not by your power, not by your abilities, not by what you think you know, but by the Spirit of a living God. That's your victory. Nothing less. Nothing less. That's how you overcome. That's where you're going to get your victory. It was about that confession. It was about being willing to hear from God. Oh, I'm willing to hear from God. Are you? Are you? Let me tell you something. When you start listening to God, it probably is not what you want to hear. It will always be what you need to hear. Do you really want a preacher to tell you what the Lord says? Because I'm going to tell you something, you may not like your preacher very long. Because if a preacher is willing to listen to God, then God's going to give him messages that are not fun at times. He's going to give him messages that are going to hit you right where you live, where he wants to move you from. Because you are in the mire, you are in the cistern, you are in the bottom of the pit because of living according to what you think is the best thing to do. You are where you are because of the decisions that you've made in your life. You are in the pit because you think you know better than God and you've never truly, really given yourself completely to God. What's wrong with the church today? We want to play church instead of having church. We want to go to church instead of church. We, we want to see God instead of God getting inside of us. And because when God gets inside of us, He alters us. He changes us. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't, don't be conformed to this world any longer. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want you to get this. God desires to reveal Himself to you in a new and a refreshing way on a daily basis. But this new revelation is not something that's outside of Scripture. Somebody trying to sell you a new song? They're trying to sell you a new religion? They're trying to sell you a new truth? Flush it right on down the toilet. It's, I, I, please know this. Your victory will always line up with the Scripture. And more than likely, it will always come from the Scripture. Amen. you got to know it. you got to hang on to it. I'll go back to verse 2. Connor, you got to take us back, back and forth. He lifted me out of the horrible pit, out of the mud, and out of the mire. Once... David began to look to God for direction. He set his feet on a solid surface. That's where God began to give David a new song. And as I mentioned earlier, a song that he put in his mouth, not his heart. So it's, it's important that you understand that. Because listen, jump down to verse 9. Connor, jump down with us to verse 9. It says, I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, David said, as you know, O Lord. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. When God gave David revelation, he didn't keep it to himself. He told everyone else about what God had done in his life. And when he began to do that, people began to notice something different about David when, when you get a real revelation from God and he alters your life and he lifts you up and he puts you on that solid surface or that rock that you now understand that it's all about Christ my truth comes from him it's not me God's the one that gives the revelation in my life and when my eyes open man I begin to sing that song I don't care if anybody likes my voice or don't like my voice I don't care if they want to hear about God or they don't want to hear about God I'm going I in fact it's like the it's like those men that were thrown in prison and told to keep their mouth shut. They said, do whatever you want to do. We can't help but tell about what God has done in our life. David vocalized it. He began to to tell other individuals. And verse 3 says, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Waiting on God doesn't just change your life. It affects everybody around you. You getting victory this morning in your life. You making a decision that no matter what's going on in your life or how far down in the pit you are, you understand that my help cometh from the Lord. You lift up your eyes and you look unto the hills from which cometh your help and you trust Him. And I'm telling you, when you call on the name of the Lord, God hears you. When you have an understanding that your help is not in anybody else, that you are sinking and there's nothing that you can do You're going to have to wait on somebody to extend the golf club. You're going to have to wait on somebody to extend a hand. And I'm telling you, it's not the person beside you. It's not me. It's the hand of a living God that reaches from the very portals of heaven right into your mess and lifts you up and plants you on a solid surface. That's your help. David began to sing his song. And as he did, everybody began to take notice and fear the Lord for what God has done. Trusting in the Lord. We'll try to go a little deep here. Are you okay for us to go a little deep? 
Hey, hang on just for a few minutes so we can get into a little bit deeper waters. Trusting God is a deep spiritual thing, folks. It, it, this, oh, I trust the God. You can look on most people's face and see they don't really understand what it means by trusting God. <laughs> I'm trusting God. You're trusting God when you're trying to figure out how you're going to get out of it yourself. What can I do to make this better? Trusting God. Do you believe that God has promises for you? Can I just ask you that question? Amen. Well, he's probably disappointed in that reaction. Do you believe God has promises for you? Amen. Do you believe God loves you? Do you believe he cares about you? Do you think he's concerned about what's going on in your life right now? Really? Do you think that your trouble, your, 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 the fears that you have, the anxiety that you have, the sense that the wolves are gathering around you, do you think that God really cares what's going on in your life? Okay? Let's see. What God needs to do for you, He's already done. It's already done. The answer to your problem has already been given. The, the, the remedy for you being in that horrible pit has already been paid for. It's done. Well, that should make you feel a little bit better. Right? Have you ever been in a, have you ever been in a terrible accident? Hurt? Or seeing somebody been in a terrible accident and hurt, and you got people standing around there. You, you guys in the police force, you've seen that, haven't you? Hold on, ma'am. Hold on. Police is coming. Ambulance is coming. What kind of comfort do you think that's given them? Thank you. But do you think when they hear that noise, woo, 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 do you think that makes them feel a little bit better? Oh, yeah. You know, you told me they were coming, but that's one thing. Now I hear them coming. That's another thing. Me saying I trust God's one thing. But for me to know it is something that is entirely different. Turn real quickly. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. I don't have the time on that screen. Well, I got it on my arm. Ooh, I got it. I got it. I got it. You just hang on. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. I want you to look at a, at a couple of concepts here to understand why we do not always receive God's promises. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires we got two forces at work here. we got the sinful nature and we got the Spirit of God. And very often, you may think you're spiritual and not even realize that it's your sinful nature that is controlling your thoughts in your life. Even though you can say, I know God's got it. I know God's got it. I know God can handle it. I know I'm coming out of this thing. But yet, the whole time, you're being controlled by your sinful nature. And you don't even know it. That nature down deep with you is overriding what you know in your mind spiritually. Oh, this is so difficult for pastors. We preach truth all the time. But it's one thing when you preach truth, and then when you're thrown into a situation personally, and now you've got to live it. It's one thing for me to say, God's got this and you're going to be okay. We're praying for you. The church is praying for you. And we know until you realize, i got to pray for myself now. And to come to the understanding, the difference between being controlled by a sinful nature and a spiritual nature, when all the while you know that I've got to be controlled by the spiritual nature of my life, but we don't get it. These two forces at work. 
See, the, the sinful nature stems from the soul of man. It, it's the non-physical part of a man that's part of that, of that body. It, it, it's, it, it's who you are. It's your mind. It's your emotions. It's your, it's your personality. And we tend to think that when we talk about living according to the sinful nature, we are referring to things that we do that are contrary to the Word of God. But when we operate out of the soul, or out of the emotion, or out of the mind, or out of the personality, we're operating out of the sinful nature. When our emotions control us, when our mind controls us, when our personality controls us, it all stems from the sinful nature. It's not out of some just point-blank sin that we've occurred. It's out of the nature of who we are. And that's why we're in the mire. That's why we're sinking. That's why we're in the cistern. That's why everything in our life is going wrong because that's what's controlling us. And all the while, we even get emotional before God. It's why, listen, sometimes as Pentecostals, we get emotional. And, and if we're not careful, that emotion that we get is operating out of our sinful nature. But that's hard to understand, isn't it? How in the world can I be up front and praising God and worshiping God and it's out of my sinful nature? Because it's out of your emotion, it's out of your personality. It's not out of, you see, that's why we tell you over and over and over, your worship shouldn't come from your emotions. Your worship could, should come from your knowledge of who Jesus is and what He's done in your life, how He's ripped you out of a horrible, horrible life and He set your feet on a solid ground and He saved you. And because of what He's done for you, who He is, I worship Him. I admire Him. I give Him glory. I give Him praise because He deserves it. I don't care who's listening to me. I don't care who's around me. It's not my emotion. It's my relationship. And because of my relationship, I worship Him. Because of my relationship with Him, I know I'm not going to die in this thing. Because of my relationship, I know I'm not going to be destroyed. There's a fine, fine line here that we've got to understand. So even though that we, we are making every attempt to live according to God's Word, in essence, we are trying to do it out of self. Out of our soul. Paul says that when we are trying to live in a right way by doing what seems right, we are depending on the sinful nature and end up doing what the nature desires. In other words, the things that I don't want to do, I do them. Hang on. Hang on. We can get to that song in just a minute. But you see, you can never sing your song effectively until you have an understanding. Church after church after church today are full of churches that are singing their songs. Full of emotion. Full of personality. Some are full of dancing. Some are full of all, all kind of things that we do in our churches. We like to wave banners and we like to dance and we like to do all those things. And it's all out of a sinful nature. Does it move the heart of God? It doesn't lift us out of our miry clay. So people come to church and they do all of those things and before they ever get to their car, they're already sinking again. Well, they had a little lift. They had a little tug. But you see, when I was sinking in that mud, I needed more than a little tug. I needed a change. I needed to get from there 
to something solid. I needed somebody to do more than just say, hold on, I'll help you out. I needed more than this too. I needed more than those other three guys that were golfing with me to say, oh, Jay, our father, you know he's about to die. Would you please just lift him up out of that mire? I'm going to tell you something. If those three guys, one of them was a preacher. If those three guys would have knelt on their knees to pray for me, I'd have, I would have, if I would have had a golf club in my hand, I would have popped them right side to the head. I need, I need you to help me, man. So that's, our, that's we as church people. Because we think that, that sounds spiritual. I'm praying for you. You know, what, you know what, for the most part, telling somebody you're praying for them is? Just to get them out your way. Just to get them out your way. When God would say to you, I sent you to do more than pray. I sent you there to help them. Well, now, God, if I go over there and try to lift Jay out of that mud, I, I'm, I mean, I could be hitting my own ball. I could, advance, I could be advancing myself. We don't like to say it in those terms, but that's what we do in our churches. We don't want to really help somebody because we can't because we're not on solid ground ourselves. We're operating our churches and our lives and our families. We're operating them out of a sinful nature that we like to cover it with saying, oh, we're spiritual. Saying you're spiritual doesn't make you spiritual. An understanding of the things of God, that's what makes you spiritual. If you're walking in the Spirit, okay, then you have your mind set on spiritual things. I'm going to move on real quickly. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Listen to this. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Spirit tells us that we're God's children. You can say you're God's child all you want to, but that don't make you God's child. The, 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 the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His suffering in order that we may also share in His glory. So we, we ask questions like this. What do I have to do to be healed? When we ask questions that, that sound like this, how can I receive all the promises of God? What we're doing is asking, how can we receive spiritual, spiritual results in a sinful nature? And here's your answer. You can't. It's impossible. You cannot receive the spiritual uplifting of God in your life and planting you on solid ground when you are operating out of that sinful nature. I want something from me. I don't want to feel this way anymore. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I, I, you know, we, we've got to understand things. God and His things are in, are, are, are in spiritual form, not sinful nature. And you have to receive them in your spirit man first. I want to close with this. Deep. Calls to deep. Does that make sense to you? The spirit man, who you Really are. The deepest things of you. Beyond your, beyond your sinful nature. In other words, beyond your emotion. Beyond your personality. Beyond your feelings. Who you are. Calls to God. And that's when we receive the spiritual promises of God. Psalms, that 40th chapter. Verse 5. Many, O oh Lord my God, are the wonders that you have done. The things that you planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of, of them, they would be too many to declare. 
What do you think all the miracles of God and all the things that He worked through men, why do you think that all of those miracles are recorded in the Bible? Why do you think the healing of sick, raising of the dead, why, why do you think that all of those things are, are simply in the Bible? As I began my Bible reading, I began to go back a number of days ago and began reading through the Gospels. And as I began to see miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus performed, I got to tell you that something inside of me began to come alive. Why did he do these things? Why did he record these things? Perhaps to give you a more in-depth view of the nature of God. Who he is. Perhaps to increase your, your faith. For faith comes by hearing the word of God. Perhaps so that you can know that those same things are available to you. James, in the, in the first chapter, verse 17... Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. And it does not change. It doesn't change. <laughs> the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. What He's done for one, He'll do for another. So if this same God was a healing God in the Bible, does that mean He's a healing God today? I'm going to ask you that one more time so that, because I really want you to, to see if you understand that. If this same God was a healing God in the Bible, is He a healing God today? Why? Because that's His nature. That's who He is. If this same God was the one that provided in the Bible, is He the same God that, that provides today? If He's the same God that lifted David out of the mire, out of the cistern, and set him on a solid ground... Can that same God lift me up out of my mire today? Of course He can. Because it's His nature. It's who He is. Yeah, but, but you don't know what I'm going through. I don't care what you're going through. It's a new day. It's a new dawning. And I hope, if nothing else, that what you've received from this word today is that it's a new moment in your life to lift up your head and understand it's not about your circumstances. It's not about your pain. It's not about your anguish. It's all about your healing, living, redeeming God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything you think or ask according to the power that works in your life. Let the move of God work in your life. Let the power of God reach down and lift you up. Understand His nature. And let the same Spirit of God that spoke to Peter and said, He's the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. Let that truth ring in your ears. John the Baptist said, Ask Him, is he the one or do we need to look for another? And Jesus said, you go back and you tell John about the miracles that you've seen. The dead being raised. The blind open eyes being opened. The victory that's come. There's no need to look for another. There's no need to look to a doctor. There's no need to look to a preacher. There's no need to look to a church. Look to the God of your salvation. He's your answer. He's sovereign. Can you handle this one? Yeah. So what do I do? I hope this morning that the knowledge that I'm trying to give you 
that God is your source will be the song that's put in your mouth today. That I hope in just a moment you will stand to your feet and you'll start singing a new song. God is my peace. God is my joy. God is my hope. God is my redemption. God is my defense. Everything you need is God. It's God. Start singing your song. Start giving Him praise. And as you do, He lifts you up. He plants you on a solid ground, a solid surface. And you begin to praise Him. You begin to give Him glory. Not because I tell you to lift your hands, but because it comes from a spontaneous knowledge that He's in control. He's in control. He's in control. (laughs) He's in control. What do I do? You do one or two things. You let one of those two natures control you right now. You let your emotion, you let your fear, you let your doubt, you let your personality keep you sitting right in your chair. And you leave this place today just like you were when you came pressed, down and out, and worried about what's going to happen. Worried about how you're going to pay your light bill. Worried about how you're going to make your house payment. Worried about your car. Worried about this. Worried about your marriage. Worried about what, I don't care what you were. Or you will either let the Spirit of God become alive within you. And you'll begin to say, God is my defense. God is my help. I will trust in Him. Devil, you're a liar. You'll begin to lift your heads and praise. You'll say, I don't care what the doctor said. I know what my God said. I choose to believe Him. And when you do that, when you begin to sing that song, you will feel yourself coming up out of the mire, out of the hole. You'll find yourself on a solid surface and you'll begin to say, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm out of this thing. I may still have the circumstances, but I'm still, I'm I'm above that. I'm not going back. And you'll feel a tug of the devil trying to pull you down. And you'll still begin to praise God. I got to hush. Some of you saying, if this is the new hymn, I don't like him. Well, I tell you what. I'm sorry. Oh, you know what? I'm not sorry. I could care less whether you like it or whether you don't. I need. I need. Listen. We're going through the through the the worst pit we've ever gone through in our in our 31 years of marriage. But I know her 52 years of life. And it's way beyond the loss of her father. But I'm not gonna live there. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that now. I'm not gonna live there. I'm not gonna give I'm not gonna give the devil any inch. My Redeemer liveth. God spoke to my heart. God's let me know I got this thing. God's let me know I'm going to fix this thing. And, you know, and I try to remind you, that sinful nature kicks up. You know, God, you got, you know, you got this on the front, and you got that on the front. You got, I, do you think He doesn't know what's out there? Do you think He doesn't know what the devil has set up and what he's trying to do? Well, people are going to say this about you. They're going to say, I don't care what people say. You can go ahead and get in a group and have a meal every dinner and just barbecue the pastor. I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore. Years ago, man, I had a big butt. It's been chewed on so much, there's not much left. I don't care. You can have what's left. Anybody want to sing a new song? If you want to sing a new song, how about stand by? I want want to say, I don't know what you're playing. It's a new song to me. Let's sing it. Hey, this is not a corporate song here today. This is not a corporate song. I want to do something right where we are. I want every one of you to sing your song. Your song. 
And your song right now is going to be closing your eyes and lifting your head. And you, right where you are, right where the mess in your life is, I want you to start thanking God. God, you are my source of deliverance. You're my healer. You're my salvation. You're going to pull me out of this thing. I want you to focus and start just praising God. And as you do, when that joy begins to spring up within you, I just want you to step out from where you are and let's just come around the altar and give God glory and praise for the foundation that He's going to put us on. Right where you are. Right where you are. Lift your heads right now. Start singing unto the Lord. Oh, Father. Father, I thank You. You know where I am. You know this cistern. You know this pit. You know what the enemy has set up. But oh God, you're bigger than anything the enemy has ever tried to do. You are my source. You are my hope. You're my strength. You're my joy. And hallelujah, I'm coming out of it. Coming out of it. So Father, all over the sanctuary, may we move beyond our emotion. May we move beyond the sinful nature and may we get into the deep spiritual things of God. You're it. You're it. You're it. By faith, Father, we're going to leave our pew. And we're going to go to the altar thanking you for redemption. We're going to go to the altar, Father, thanking you for victory in our lives. By faith, we believe it. We stand on it. You want victory? You want a new year? Step out by faith. Step out by faith. The best year of your life is coming up. Step out by faith. Or let the nature keep you right in the hole. Let the sinful nature keep you right on doing what you've been doing. Let the sinful nature keep on keep you believing what you've been believing. Let the sinful nature keep you depressed and down out. On and on and on and on. That's up to you. But if you want to hear from the Lord, you want to sing a new song, then trust the Lord. This may be uncomfortable for you right now, but I want to tell you something. This is important. I can't sing your song for you. I can't pray for you right now. I can't get you out of that mess anymore. I'm not your, I'm not your source of hope. I'm not your victory. God is. God is. So ask Him. Tell Him what you need. Don't be ashamed of anybody around you. Don't worry about what people think around you. There ought to be some noise around the altar. There ought to be some calling out to God around the altar. You're not going to have, a, you're not going to have any better year today than you had last year. You're not going to have any better day today than you had yesterday until you start calling on the Lord. Quit telling everybody else about it. Tell God about it. Quit whining. Quit complaining. Start trusting. Start trusting. Tell Him. Tell Him, tell Him, tell Him. preparing you. That's why you're where you are. You're where you are because God allowed you to be there. So let him finish what he's trying to do.
today by telling you a story about an elevator. Some of us want to take our poor, decrepit, messed up, hurtful, broken lives. And we want to step into an elevator door. And we want it to open up a few seconds later and everything's gone. And no pain and no heartache and no trouble. It just doesn't work that way. It's referred to as life. That we have to live until the Lord calls us and takes us home. And unfortunately, life has pits. That we sometimes feel like that we're in a miry clay and a cistern with no hope. But you do have hope. And with the knowledge of who Jesus is and recognizing Him, and exalting Him to let the spiritual nature of yourself go beyond your emotions, go beyond your personality, and get to the real truth of who you are and let it connect with the truth of who He is. And you'll find the peace that passeth all of your understanding. And you'll begin to feel a firmness underneath you. You'll begin to feel a supernatural strength. And you'll begin to praise God and rejoice and everybody around you will begin to see just how awesome God is because they will see that He's brought you from something and your voice proclaims the victory. For what comes out of your mouth tells everybody else what's controlling you, either your sinful nature or your spiritual nature. And let's just don't try to be so spiritual today that we like to think that we always operate spiritually. We operate from our sinful nature so often, just as Peter. When, when, when Jesus said, Thou art, Peter, Christ has revealed it, you're a rock. And just a few verses later, he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now you're listening to your emotions. Now you're trying to get me from going to the cross because that's what your emotion is saying. That's what your mind is saying. You don't understand that. That's the will of God, the cross. Get thee behind me, Satan. We constantly battle with that sinful nature and that spiritual nature. But that sinful nature will put you in the mire. That spiritual nature will put you on a rock. Put you on a rock. Where do you want to live? In your mess or on the rock? It all depends on who you listen to. 
And that was my message for the third time today. Did everybody get it? If you didn't, I did. And now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in His sight. Oh Lord, my strength, my Redeemer, my rock. Hallelujah. The words of my mouth what comes out of here. May it tell you I'm solid. Not because of me. But because of my God. My God. My God. My God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, what do I do now? By faith, turn to someone and say, My God's in control. My God's in control. I trust Him.